<laughs> Anthony, the stage is yours. All right. Okay. Oh, shit, not again. <laughs> All right, good afternoon. Whoa! Yeah, there we go. I should be quieter? Okay. Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to it. You made it. You're still around. You're still alive. Thank God. Do you know where you were 24 years ago? I know where I was because I've got photographic proof. Uh, I was at a LAN party living the good life, uh, playing Action Quake 2 on Windows 2000 on 24 Diet Pepsis. I, had, I hadn't yet discovered the magic of vodka. I also know where I was seven and a half years ago. I was holding the tiniest, most significant piece of evidence that I would ever find in 15 years of criminal investigations. This case that I'm gonna talk about, to say it was unusual for our little agency is an understatement. It would take us all sorts of weird places, like under a killer's car at three in the morning outside their house, and to an even more awkward than usual IT office. And this isn't so surprising, but behind a keyboard, the surprising bit is it was 3,000 hours behind a keyboard. And we got by with a little help from our friend DMX, RIP. Most important part of the talk is the disclaimer, so we're going to talk first off about trigger warning. I'm going to talk about violence. You're not going to see crime scene photos or anything like that, but I'm going to talk about it. Spoiler alert, if you have not seen the Dateline or the Netflix that covers this case, I'm going to ruin the ending for you in two minutes. These are my personal opinions. I'm not representing my employer. It is Sunday. I am off duty. I'm in my shorts. My Duolingo streak is frozen. There you go. I also happen to love my job and my streak of not getting sued. So uh, please help me continue that. Here's the agenda. We're pretty much going to have to gloss over all of this. Um, in fact, there'll be no time for questions for sure. Meet me at the uh, outside after this. Catch me outside, I guess. Uh, the reason we won't have time is because we're talking about a five-year case, and when we talk about this to cops, we give them a case study, it takes two hours. Now, when you talk to cops, you have to talk slower with smaller words, but we're going to give the 20-minute version here. So I do digital forensics, law enforcement digital forensics. Uh, you might do DFER, digital forensics incident response. We are not the same, but we have a lot in common. Your job's harder because you've got to reverse engineer malware written by nation state actors. Our job's harder because we've got to get evidence that our customers don't want to give us, and we have to do it lawfully and then prove later on in court we did it lawfully. The theme this year is engage. We're talking about reversing the enshittification of the internet and probably society at large. For me, openness, transparency, is something we could do with more of, especially in government in general and law enforcement in particular. And I'm not going to use this slide to make subtle uh, political... What, Okay, hold up. Can you edit this out of the live stream? <laughs> Were there slides before that? No, we haven't seen any of Are you kidding me and you waited this long? <laughs> oh. Welcome to the talk. Okay. You heard the lamb party bit, and it was a good joke, and you didn't get the visual. Uh, you heard the smallest piece of evidence. Weird places we're going. Under a car. IT. Keyboard. DMX. Come on, DMX. No wonder. I, I thought I was just... I had flop sweat up here. Anyway. You got the disclaimer. You got, a vi you got that. Here's our agenda. Ignore it. And, uh, yeah. Like I said, it takes a long time to tell this story to cops. We're going to give it to you in 20 minutes. So, defer, DF, whatever. Engage, of course. Openness. This is what I was talking about, the transparency. Now, I'm not going to use the slide to make some subtle political point. I'm just going to say we could use more of it. For me, forensics is a shining light in this area because law enforcement forensics, it, we can be, be a beacon because, uh, because what we do is try to find the truth of what happened. It's not our job to decide whether somebody's guilty or innocent. That's the jury and judge's job. Our job is just to find stuff and bring it there. And in fact, we have a duty. If we find stuff that says that a defendant is not guilty, we have to turn it over or we lose our careers and possibly go to jail. I tried to find a through line in this case and in this talk. 
I wanted to find one thing to pull out of it, so here's what it is. I'm not going to read a lot of slides to give verbatim, but victims should be our focus. And one attribute or diagnosis does not define a person. Our victim in this case is Carrie Farver. She went missing in November of 2012. She's 37 years old, has a teenage son. She works as a computer programmer in Omaha, Nebraska. She lives in Macedonia, Iowa, about an hour away. She was dating Dave at the time. Uh, they'd been dating about two weeks, and Dave just got out of a long-term relationship with a woman named Amy. Dave and Amy were together 11 years. They had two kids, didn't get married. He's not looking for commitment anymore. He's upfront with the women he dates. He says, I'm just looking for casual dating. And he's getting back on, the, he hasn't dated since like the Clinton administration. So he's getting back on, what do you do? You go to plentyoffish.com, just like all of you. And when you go to Plenty of Fish, he ends up meeting, before he meets Carrie, he meets a woman called Lilith. I'm gonna call her Lilith, but uh, Lilith's about his age, they're dating, and she is looking for a commitment. She says that, he's up front with her like everyone else. Uh, she kind of pushes, they end up dating on again, off again. Now this slide's gonna, you're gonna see this and say, look at this egotistical bastard, puts a picture of himself on a slide. <laughs> this is from the Netflix show, that's, so it's there, A, because of that, B, because it is kind of a cool special effect they did, and C, because they did me dirty. If you open the Netflix app on your phone, you put the word stalker in, you probably get my face. <laughs> Lover, stalker, killer, I'm none of these things. <laughs> so anyway, back to Dave's place. Dave lives in Omaha, Nebraska. He's actually within walking distance of Carrie's office. And so this works out great. For two weeks, they're dating. She's crashing at his place most of the time because it saves her a two-hour round trip. And this is going well until the 13th of November, 2012. Dave works as an auto mechanic, he goes to work, a few hours into a shift, he gets a text from Carrie. Now this is weird because Dave, before he could even give his spiel about casual dating, Carrie gave hers and she said, look, I'm not looking for anything serious. So he gets a text, says, let's move in together. It's, this is out of left field, he responds, I thought we were on the same page, and then he gets this barrage of mean texts back, saying, I hate you, I'm seeing someone else, whatever. He gets home, and finds his apartment, there's no trace of Carrie anymore. She's taken all of her stuff. He figures he dodged a bullet. Now, we are short on time, so we're gonna have to hack it. We're gonna hack time. Uh, moving ahead, for the next three years, Dave and Lilith date on again, off again. And there's this thing, wherever they start to drift apart, text messages come in from Carrie, texts and emails, and they say something like, I'm watching you, and have these stalking photos attached. Or there's pictures of vandalism to Lilith's garage, or, it escalates in 2013. There's a fire set to Lilith's house. Obvious intentional arson. And Carrie admits to it by email. Now, the Omaha Police Department, they get a warrant for Carrie's arrest because of all these things that are going on. Meanwhile, she's still a missing person on the Iowa side of the Missouri River. And so in our agency, the original investigators go to Carrie's house. It looks like somebody just up and left. They didn't plan this thing. They also find Carrie's medications. Now this clouds the investigation. It clouds the investigation because they find meds for bipolar disorder. Yes, Carrie had struggled with bipolar disorder in the past. She was in a good place though when she went missing and her life was going pretty well. She had her, her dream job, her son's doing great. They saw this and the stigma of mental illness can cloud people's vision and they thought, well, this makes sense because these emails and these texts that come in, they say that she's taken off and might have checked into a hospital or whatever. Maybe she really is, you know, on her, off on her own accord. This also got muddy because of the jurisdictional issue. You've got two different jurisdictions separated by a river. On the west side, you've got Nebraska, and there, the Omaha Police Department is going after Carrie for all these harassments and vandalisms and stalking, the arson. And on the Iowa side, they've got a missing person, and there's this confirmation bias that kicks in because on the Iowa side, they are wondering, is Carrie still around? Well, yes, look at this pile of police reports. The case goes cold in 2014. There's not a lot of new leads coming in. Occasionally a text or an email, all the IPs are coming back to VPNs, not traceable. In 2015, uh, investigator Doty, Corporal Avis, and I, we revisited this case. And so if you haven't figured out from the way that I look or sound or am, I am the nerd at the sheriff's office. <laughs> uh, the, I'm a hacker and I carry a badge, and there are dozens of us, dozens. <laughs> this is my CV slide, I gotta establish my bona fides. Um, so I've redacted my original employer up there, but um, in any case, I, I had a 15 to 17 year sentence in IT. Uh, I 
for the last eight years, I was working in our county's IT department, and I was moonlighting as a reserve deputy in our sheriff's office for a dollar a year. In fact, during this case, I made about three dollars. Uh, because I, and helping out with digital forensics and so on. So my job now is I do digital forensics, cyber investigations, I work on the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force, uh, and do anything else geeky the sheriff needs. This isn't an official part of my CV, but one of my favorite times testifying in federal court, um, I was questioned by the defense attorney, he starts his line of questions, he says, Deputy Kava, <laughs> you're a wizard, Harry. Deputy Kava, you're an expert in pornography. And in that pause, I just said, thank you, because <laughs> as I know the stenographer's gonna type it down, it goes in the transcript, and now I'm on the record as a federal porn expert. <laughs> and my parents are proud. Uh, yep. uh, also, uh, I know it's not as much of an achievement here when I'm surrounded by 30,000 porn experts. Uh, I've never given a main stage talk before. I've, I've given talks to some villages. Uh, shout out to Sky Talks, uh, AppSec Village, Recon Village, DC402, our local group, and the Colonel Khan Conference. Um, I've been a hacker my whole life, though. Ever since I was a kid, late 80s, early 90s, dialing bulletin boards, reading text files, I thought, hacker, that's me. That makes sense. This kid was getting root from his 8086 there on his lap. Uh, this kid also is a freaking idiot and didn't understand you could trace modem calls. And so, Around the time this photo is taken is also the first time, but not the last, that I'd be accused of uh, violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. But we don't have time for that, that's a different talk. So back to the case file. Uh, we are bring, we've revisited this cold case, and we've got three or four years worth of uh, history to look at. So we're going through all the incidents that have happened up to here. At this point, when this start, case started out, if you'd look at the digital evidence, there were just a few bits here and there. But at this point, things have accumulated, uh, which helps us out, actually. Uh, Dave has gotten over 10 or 12,000 fake emails from Carrie. Uh, I'm going to have to fast forward again. This is the ultimate spoiler for you. So if you haven't watched the Netflix show, uh, pause, go watch the Netflix show, come back. <laughs> if you're here in person, you're screwed. So here we go. You may have already guessed, but here's our spoiler. It's Lilith. Everything, all the text, the emails, the harassment, the stalking, the burglaries, the arson, and probably the murder of Carrie Farber. In fact, we're sure the murder of Carrie Farber is all attributed to Lilith. She's been doing all this all along. For three years, she's pretended to be Carrie online. And things are coming together. We're working towards an arrest warrant, but we've got to have our ducks in a row because we, can only, we only get one shot at trying her for the murder. And we don't have a body, so we've got to find all the evidence we can. And then things escalate. In December of 2015, Lilith is shot in a park next to our sheriff's office. And when she's questioned about it, who shot you? This time, she doesn't blame Carrie. Like, everything else has been blamed on Carrie. She pivots. She blames Amy. Coincidentally, Dave and Amy are just about to move in together. And now Amy is in her sights. So that puts us under her car. We get a, G a warrant for GPS. We're tracking her car. This is an average day on the GPS tracker. Instead of taking the straight path to work, every day she goes on patrol and checks Dave and Amy's apartments. She's stalking them. We bring her in for an interview. And for those of you not from the U.S., cops can lie to you in the U.S within reason. So uh, this is Dodie, brings her in and says, look, uh, I want to help you. And I believe all this bullshit you're giving us about Amy shooting you. So here's the thing. If she would shoot you, maybe she also killed Carrie. And if you could get us any evidence on that, we'll make a case against Amy and put her in prison. And so surprise, surprise, within about two days, Lilith is getting emails from Amy, who's never emailed her before. And she basically, Amy basically admits to every crime that's happened in the Omaha metro area in the last three years. Based on that, because we've got some new evidence, we're able to get warrants for residences. So we hit two residences. One of them is Lilith's new place in Persia, Iowa, her new apartment. The other one is the home of an IT employee at our county. And at the time, I'm his boss. So that was awkward. I'm the guy on the right. So anyway. That was awkward. We had to go search those places. Here's Lilith's place in Persia. This is the actual place. Fun fact, used to be a mortuary. So uh, we went in there, we did a search warrant. We found some good evidence, including this camcorder. This camcorder belonged to Carrie Farber. It was in Lilith's bedroom closet. Uh, everything we have points to this taking place in Omaha, Nebraska, that Carrie was killed there. And so we are having meetings with the Omaha Police Department and the Douglas County Attorney's Office in Nebraska to prosecute this thing in their jurisdiction. 
And what I'm doing is I'm trying to, on the digital side, find coincidences. I'm trying to tie things together. We want to attribute these confession emails to Lilith, but most of the time she's using a VPN. About 1% of the time she screws up. She has 60 or 80 fake accounts she's using, and we can attribute some of them to her directly. The rest are all VPNs only. So what I'm trying to do is find coincidence so we can tie the VPN traffic to her. We've got digital overload with this thing. We're hitting all the places you see listed here, and more with subpoenas and search warrants. And that gives us 80 gigs of legal responses. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, that's just text. And then we've got terabytes of physical media, USB sticks, hard drives, SD cards, everything. 100,000 emails and texts, half a million IP address records. And there is no off the shelf Microsoft cold case homicide that you can throw at this. So what, what do you do when the going gets tough? The old and bald write Pearl. And that's what I did. So I created a system, I called it DEX. It's a MariaDB database. It's Perl on, uh, on the front end and back. And I called it DEX as an homage to Dexter. I think I was watching Dexter at the time and also because it's an index for this entire case. Why did I write it in Perl? Apart from Perl being the best programming language ever conceived, uh, <laughs> Perl is custom fucking designed for this. Perl is made to parse text. Perl is regex native. It's beautiful. I love it. So anyway, people watch this and so nerds on the internet ask, why didn't you just like sort the IPs and pick the top one? Because if you watch the Netflix documentary, it looks like that's what I could have done. Well, because there's more to it. We've got 60 or 80 different sources of information, 60 or 80 different formats, plus all the stuff off these drives. Anyway, I wrote parsers in Perl and I'm looking for four main things. I want dates and times, email addresses, IP addresses, and the context where I found that stuff. That all goes into the DEX database. And then, at the same time, I'm collecting OSINT. I'm trying to identify some of these IPs and tie them to a VPN provider. And so the way I'm doing that is through Whois records, but that's not complete. I'm doing that through DNS, that's not complete. And then I've got experimental stuff uh, with Perl where I'm actually making connections uh, to these with their client, recording the uh, exit node IP, and doing it again. That all goes into the DEX database. I've also got all this media in my lab. And so I don't have enough storage space to take a copy of every piece. I wish I did. So what I started doing is triaging it. Why, how do I triage it? I could use something, you know, a commercial tool, but I use strings and XZ and grep. Why? Because I can save a nice highly compressed copy of the strings that are in there. And I can look for the thing I need, which is basically the year 2012 or 2013. Is there anything from there? I'm also using an open source tool called Scalpel for recovering deleted stuff for carving files. Uh, they have this cool preview mode where I can just record all the offsets of where the deleted stuff is without having to do it. So you look at the Netflix documentary, you see this. That's how it gets there though. It's a lot of work goes into it. Um, I did end up on uh, our master hacker, which is kind of a, uh, uh, what do you call it, bucket list item for me anyway. That's, I just want to tell you, that is movie magic. This is not my office. This is not my computer. This is not my beautiful house. This is the, the set that they used. And yes, it's movie magic to explain it. Why didn't I use expensive commercial forensic tools? I have access to some of them. First off, they crash all the time. Now, I want to point out how classy this presentation is. I could have done a CrowdStrike joke here, but this is a classy presentation and we are not going to do that. These commercial forensic tools, they don't have save points either, so you can't pick up where you left off. They're like, they're like two out of three of my wives. I liked them, I couldn't trust them. So, I use DEX. DEX lets me reinvent the wheel. If you write Perl, that's what you do. Um, it's resilient, if it messes up, it can pick up where it left off. It's fast because it's minimalist. I just go after those four fields, that's it. It's cheap, it's open source software, and my time is worthless. So. What if you're too poor to store all the stuff you're trying to carve? Well, I wrote something for that too. Nobody's ever started on GitHub. I, I've been using it for seven years, it helps me. So anyway, back to the case. So I'm doing all the forensic stuff, writing the longest report I've ever written, uh, turning that into a thousand slide uh, demonstrative exhibit for court. And here's my secret. When I go to testify, and even before I talk today, besides the five shots of espresso and whatever the hell that was, um, <laughs> I listen to DMX to get in the right mindset. Um, just one more thing. We went and talked to Dave again. Avis and I interviewed him three months before the trial. And when we interviewed him, uh, we've asked him every time we talked to him, a thousand times, do you have any more electronics from back then? He always says no. I pulled the one interview technique I know, a Columbo, and I turned around and said, just one more thing before we left. Do you have any electronics? He says, oh, you know what? I found this tablet, actually. You want to take a look at it? Yes, please. Take a look at the tablet. Tablet's boring, but it's got this micro SD card in it. The SD card, it was formatted in 2014, but it has tens of thousands of JPEGs on it deleted. Over 400 of them, 
are bit for bit matches. The hash values match a phone dump the original investigators did in 2013 of Lilith's phone, plus her phone serial number is in the Android logs that I get out of it. It also has the best evidence we're going to find this case. They're this size. Two 96 pixel images and one 200 pixel image. I'm not going to show you the actual images because of what they, what they have in them, but I'm going to show you just an example. So here's a full resolution image. When you go down to 200 pixels at, in sepia tone, you still get pretty good detail and in 96 pixel, same thing. These pictures, they show a body in a state of decomposition and there's enough detail that you can tell that. And what's more, they have tattoos visible that we know Carrie Farver had. We do not find Carrie Farver's body, but we know Lilith took pictures of it after she was dead. This is the best evidence we're going to find. It's the, uh, it's the um, smoking gun in this case. So where does that get us? It gets us to a guilty verdict and she gets life in prison for the murder plus 20 years on the arson. I don't know if you can ever actually bring closure to a family in these kind of cases, but we were able to get them some answers and that meant that they could have a celebration of life ceremony and we got them a little bit of justice. So I'm very proud of that. Um, we also, th this pisses me off. On these cases like this, the killers are always the focus. If you Google Carrie Farber's name, you immediately find a picture of the person who harmed her. And so uh, Dodie Avis and I, we want to do something positive in her name. So we started a scholarship at the community college she attended. It's for IT students like her. I know all of you lost your money on slots last night or whatever, but if you have a rich uncle or aunt, uh, tell them to go farberscholarship.org, give something. If not, if you don't have money, just remember the victims. Always remember the victims. Remember Carrie Farver, not her killer. And this has been a dream come true for me. I've wanted to give a DEF CON main talk for 15 or 20 years. And um, I had one goal leading up here was to do that. Now I have a new goal and that is to give a longer DEF CON talk. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks everyone. See me. See me in the hallway after for questions, and I even have these nifty little cards that I'll give you. They're great. Thank you.